So I'm Wilma Hodges and I'll be moderating today's teaching and learning call. Um, today we have a, a great presentation that's actually uh, for those of you who weren't fortunate enough to see it at Open Aperio. Um, we have the team here from Notre Dame to present on their Atlas winning um, how to use Sakai in the Open Learning Record Warehouse topic. So that should be a great presentation. And I know I'm excited for it because I didn't get to see it at the conference. So um, before we take that on, let's uh, go ahead and just uh, see if there are any project updates or announcements um, from the group. So does anyone have anything that they would like to announce? Hi, everybody. This is Matt Burgess from UVA. Just want to give everybody a quick update on Site Builder, which is UVA's project that we've been working on with Duke and some other folks to reimagine site creation in Sakai. So, some of you may have seen our presentation or heard a little bit about that project at Open Aperio, but that project has continued to move forward. Since Open Aperio, we just finished a round of usability testing here uh, with some faculty and staff at UVA and now that that's finished we're going to move on to the actual front end design of that project and hope to start working on both the front end and the back end so that we can be done with the initial development by September or so so we're hoping to move that forward uh, get that developed get that tested and hopefully get that back to the community probably by summer of 2019 so things are looking good so far just wanted to give you all an update Awesome. Thanks, Matt. That's a really exciting project. If you guys have not seen what the UVA team is working on, it's pretty impressive. So that'll be a great addition to Sakai once it's uh, contributed back. All right. And Wilma was nice enough to uh, put a little link to a page about the project on the farm website. So if anybody hasn't visited the farm website, farm.aperio.org, uh, you can check out a link to the project page there. So thanks, Wilma, for doing that. You're very welcome. Um, Josh, did you want to give a quick update on 12.3? Yeah, just really briefly. Um, Josh Wilson from Longsite. So um, I'll, channel, uh, I'll channel Matt Jones on this one and just say that the plan is to have a uh, release candidate this week, some testing, and then uh, a 12.3 release toward the end of next week. So that's uh, that'll be that's in keeping with the plan to fast track uh, a couple of releases early on before the uh, the code freeze for the next version so we can get as many bug fixes into uh, the current release as possible. Okay, great. Um, and just one quick uh, announcement about next week. Um, there's a, the LAMP Camp conference happening next week. Um, that's in Beria, Kentucky. And um, if you've not attended before, you might want to think about maybe attending um, next year. This year is probably a little too soon to make travel plans, but <laughs> it should be a really good event. Um, they always have a lot of fun there at Atlanta Camp, and it's, um, it's very much geared towards uh, teaching and learning. So a lot of faculty uh, in attendance. So that should be fun. Josh and I will both be there, and as I think uh, – uh, Laura Geckler from Notre Dame is coming, and um, I think Dave from um, University of Dayton is going to be there. David um, is going to be talking about the attendance tool at that uh, conference. So we have a few folks from the, the larger Aperio um, sphere that are going to be att attending in addition to the, the LAMP consortium members. So, um, so that's a great conference to attend if you're looking for something to do in the summer. <laughs> um, all right, so unless anybody has any other updates, we will go ahead and get started with our headliner here, which is um, our Atlas Award winners. So uh, I will let you guys take it away. Great. Well, thank you very much. And on behalf of the University of Notre Dame, we wish you all a good day. And we're delighted to share with you our presentation from the Aperio Conference in June. So today uh, we'll be talking about um, how we've used Sakai plus the Open Learning Record Warehouse plus learning analytics to help our first year uh, students thrive at the University of Notre Dame. Um, first, uh, I'd like to underscore and repeat several times through the presentation that this has been an, a, a truly collaborative team project. Um, I'm Maureen Dawson, Assistant Dean, formerly from First Year Studies, now College of Arts and Letters. And I'm delighted to introduce to you Zhao Jing Duan, Pat Miller, 
Kevin Abbott and Alex Ambrose are uh, great colleagues from the Office of In uh, Information Technology and the Canem Center for Teaching Excellence. We've collaboratively worked on this project and we're delighted to share with you our work today. Um, all information about this project can be found from this slide. And again, this is recorded and hopefully we can share it for an even broader audience in the future. Again, uh, to underscore the collaboration of this project, uh, we note that this was the first and largest collaboration between an academic unit, first year of studies, the collegiate home of all incoming students with the Division of Student Affairs. And to launch this project, it pulled on the talents of our CANEB Center, Office of Information Technologies, and our Interdisciplinary Center for Network Science and Applications. So great teams coming together uh, for this project. And you can see our contact information there. Additionally, in terms of content within the course, we have scores of partnerships campus-wide, and this is just a sampling of the folks who have created content for our courses, provided teachers and support campus visits. It's truly a campus project um, that we present to you today. Um, this is a schematic of the process we have uh, followed in designing this presentation, but more importantly, in designing the um, Moreau First Year Experience courses. I will be talking first about how we designed very intentionally the course to collect data, um, how to identify students, notify students, and boost student performance throughout the process, evaluate our results, and share that reporting with various constituencies um, in the student body and on campus as well. Um, I'll be talking first about a couple of our design principles, and then my uh, learning colleagues will go into the detail about the data collection, identification processes, evaluations, and reporting. Our Moreau First Year Experience course is, again, a campus-wide initiative. It is the largest uh, first year course on campus intended very holistically to help students acclimate and orient to the University of Notre Dame throughout their first year. Uh, the course itself is, in fact, a sequence of FYS 101 in the fall and 101-02 in the spring. Each semester is a graded course earning students one credit letter graded. It is required of all first-time first-year students, thus it is the only course common to all students at Notre Dame. This was inaugurated in 2015, so we're going into our fourth year of the Moreau. It is collaboratively administered by the First Year of Studies and Student Affairs, again a model of collaboration between academics and student affairs, and the entire process really hinges on the flipped class model of students actively preparing through our online resources to engage in a very dynamic classroom experience. The courses meet 12 times per semester. Um, and again, they come prepared given our online materials uh, to maximize that in-class or campus visit experience. Again, the Moreau is designed to very much promote holistic student development, academic, experiential, cultural, et cetera. And our name derives from the teachings and pedagogy of Blessed Basil Moreau, the founder of the Congregation of Holy Cross, that order which founded uh, Notre Dame way back in the 19th century. To put the course in context, um, as of um, spring 2018, we have over 2,050 students enrolled in the course. We host 114 sections of the course per semester, and that will actually increase going into fall of 2018. 91% of our students consented to participate in our IRB, so we have access to gather and really analyze um, student learning analytics in depth. We um, recruit, hire, and train more than 125 instructors representing more than 50 campus units. So again, this invites the entire Notre Dame community to share its collective wisdom with our incoming students. This course generates over 4,000 credit hours a year. It is the one course common to all first year students and second to chemistry and mathematics combined. We are the third largest course on campus. We estimate that we save students over $166,000 a year in textbooks because all of our materials are um, available to students online and to instructors as well. In designing the course, again, thinking of this flipped model, we needed a course to be active and integrating all aspects of student learning. We designed the course so that all students could master the material and have a successful completion of the course and really dig deeply into the critical and independent thinking skills that college students really need to be successful in their other endeavors. Similarly, in terms of the design, uh, five basic principles. We knew that we had 
a high achieving student cohort, more than 2,000 students per year? How do you engage them in a hybrid online in-class course? How do we efficiently support more than 100 instructors coming from different professional backgrounds? How do we balance a one credit graded course over the course of the semesters with student loads of 15, 16, 17, sometimes more than 18 hours of coursework without textbooks, without lectures, without exams, making it appropriately rigorous for Notre Dame? Fourthly, we wondered how we would standardize assessment and analytical tools for the course and how can this course, and I think this might appeal to the audience at large, how can this particular course encourage resource, uh, resources and research on the support of first year student learning regardless of discipline? How does this course translate to other learning endeavors at our university and hopefully yours? I'll pass now to Kevin Abbott to talk in depth about the design challenges in Sakai. Thanks, Maureen. Um, when we were doing this, of course, Sakai was uh, our, our standard system that we use, and we uh, decided that we would uh, utilize Sakai for this. And so some of our challenges we had was, uh, Maureen mentioned, we have a large number of sections, uh, a large number of students using it, and a large number of new teachers. So that's uh, three big things right there. And uh, what we try to do is uh, we also want to make sure we would uh, uh, be able to integrate some learner data and be able to do research off that. And we also want to create a site that had very minimal support needs. And I think we achieved all those from this, uh, uh, from this particular project. In Sakai, we went through and we looked at uh, trying to use Sakai as sort of a single hub for everything. So they didn't have to go multiple places to find things. Um, we also um, sort of centralized the content in a super site. Um, a lot of it was mainly for ma easy for maintenance for us, but also uh, to be able to do click recording. And uh, so we could use that for uh, data source. And uh, we wanted to be able to create something that was very friendly to students in the coursework page, which is where all their uh, coursework they need to complete for each week is on. I'll show you that to you later. That is uh, where we try to make it very device friendly for them. And um, we tried to bring in some visual language cues uh, and some branding to make sure that uh, things were very familiar to the students, use words they, that they knew from before. And we also created a, a custom role for instructors, uh, primarily so that uh, it was to make it easier for them, but also for us as well, so that they couldn't make any changes. Uh, and for the single hub, we tried to go through and uh, we customized tool names. We um, we used LTI, of course, and Digication from ePortfolio was one of those that we used. And that, that actual uh, vendor actually wrote the LTI for, for us, which was great, and for Sakai. So that really worked out well. Um, we, um, of course, utilized a lot of the different tools, and we you know, changed names, trying to make it more uh, branded. That was very specific for Moreau. Um, we wrote an article that, uh, for Educause about sort of the some of the initial parts we did on the for the NGDLE and you can see that link there. That's also later too. Um, we centralized content in the super site. Mainly that, that super site was uh, uh, a place to log and and uh, and record all the clicks. We also used Google Analytics for clicks as well. And that course or that super site allowed us to go through and uh, pretty much make content changes in one place and it blew out all the 114 sections. So it made it easy if we had a maybe a link that was broken on one particular location, then we were able to go through and make the changes throughout the entire course very easily rather than having to go into each one separately. And as we're going over the years, we've, uh, we've evolved and tried to make this into more of a, a responsive uh, device friendly design. You can see fall 2015 and how we've moved into more of the, the colors and branding in the spring 2018. Here's sort of a larger view of it. You can see the the, uh, the mobile, actually that's a, an iPhone view on the right. So that gives you an idea of what we tried to do to make it uh, the colors uh, relate to the uh, particular units and then uh, the icons that are out there as well make, make a big difference. And we tried to go through and use uh, to be pretty consistent with icons. We try to use icons that students are familiar with. And uh, we've also tried to use uh, and try to tie those to particular things in the syllabus and the gradebook 
and just pretty much tried to make everything together tied so that it was very consistent visually. Um, also, textually or language wise, we tried to make sure we used words that were very similar or exactly the same words that were in the syllabus in the grade book. Uh, just trying to make sure that the students uh, really had no reason not to know what they were doing and how to get things done. And it worked out well. We also created a custom role and actually Laura Sierra helped to do this and Geckler. So we're very thankful for the help they gave on this. And it allows us to sort of lock down the, the course so that uh, they really can't make any changes to it. We really don't, we really don't make it as easy for them as possible. It's only a one credit hour course. So the instructors, we want them to be able to uh, just focus on uh, using the actual tools rather than having to go through and create their own, since there really there's no reason to create anything. So this worked out well for us and helped us to uh, have things very consistent across 114 sections. And our support needs um, have been very minimal for this course, which is a, a credit to Sakai and I think also to uh, how we designed the course as well. And you know, very minimal support, 52 support tickets back in 2015, we first rolled it out. You see it's sort of gone down each semester as we've gone on. And you know, some of those, even some of those higher numbers are, there are some specific reasons for that, <laughs> some minor things that have happened. So, um, but very, very minimal. You can see how as you move into the spring semester, how things go down even further. And so we've been uh, thought, that our, uh, this project has been very, Sakai has helped us to make this project, I think, very successful. We're very appreciative of, of how the tool has been being able to be customized and used for our own purposes. I'm gonna pass this on to Pat, and Pat's gonna walk through the collection of data. Hi, uh, on the basis of and foundation of what uh, Kevin just described, in which uh, the course uh, sections were um, were built so that we could collect data. I'm now going to talk about the the next challenge of of actually organizing and collecting that data. Uh, but that foundation was was very essential that Kevin was describing because without the design of the course, we wouldn't have been able to collect all the data that we did. Um, so this is uh, just a little snapshot of a whiteboard that we uh, were working with as we were figuring out how to how to get the data. Uh, you can see it, uh, it's uh, quite an unwieldy picture, but uh, the next slide shows you that uh, we did, we did uh, figure out some ways to get that data consistently and uh, organize. And here you see Sakai as the hub for gathering the data. We were getting data from Digication, our ePortfolio system, Google Analytics, um, the our cloud uh, data from uh, Sakai, uh, and uh, uh, in uh, we have a Redshift database, and then the uh, critical part was also the cloud-based learning record warehouse uh, from the Aperio Foundation, uh, and then we also had data from uh, our video repositories, Penopto, and also uh, Kaltura that's not shown. Okay, uh, from here, I'm gonna hand it over to Zhao Jing, who will uh, discuss more our the learning record store. Sure, uh, thank you, Pat. So as Pat mentioned, after we implemented this learning record store, every time a user takes an action in Sakai, an XAPI statement describing who did what and what time is sent over and stored there. So in addition to the Sakai data, we also collected the video usage data from Panopto directly. And also the uh, dedication ePortfolio data, yeah, as shown here, ePortfolio data from dedication and the Sakai grades data from the Sakai database directly. So after we collecting the data from multiple sources, I merged them into my Tableau desktop, analyzed them and created some customized reports. And then shared those reports, uh, published those reports onto our Tableau server. And from there, different stakeholders like assistant deans, advisors, or researchers can view or download them. And uh, uh, this is just a quick update. We just completed updating the learning record store to 
warehouse. The advantage of warehouse is it can ingest the data from multiple sources in both XAPI and Caliper format. So, um, for example, we tested the XAPI data from Catcher and also the Caliper data from Moodle. So hopefully, more of the learning ad, uh, ad tech vendors will implement either XAPI or Caliper standards. So we can just don't have to manually extract data from them. And as a result of this specially designed data collection process, we were able to collect data not only from multiple resources, uh, multiple sources, but also in both qualitative and quantitative formats. For example, we collected 50 million words uh, from Sakai and Digication. There were students' weekly and e-portfolio reflections. We collect uh, over 2 million clicks data and uh, over uh, 400,000 uh, 400, learning activity records. And we also conducted early and annual semester Quartrex surveys. The response rate was over 64%. All this contributed to the richness of our data. Now I will pass it back to Pat. Okay, our next challenge was to identify our exact goal and uh, how we could ensure, and our basic challenge was to identify the students that could best benefit from some type of uh, early intervention. Uh, in the next slide, um, you can see that we, our challenge was basically to ensure that everyone had the opportunity to thrive. And uh, we targeted uh, the about 40 students, the 2% who had issues with regard to thriving so that we could uh, uh, intervene and uh, improve their chances of success. Uh, on the next slide, uh, I want to take a look at um, learning analytics. So this is kind of backtracking to the meaning of learning analytics and, uh, in, and kind of putting some context on our goal. Um, the, this is a definition um, that was uh, provided um, many years ago uh, to the field of learning analytics. Um, it's the measurement, collection, analysis, reporting of data about learners for the purposes of understanding and optimizing learning and the environments in which it occurs. The, uh, the quote is from George Siemens, considered kind of the father of modern learning analytics. Uh, and you can see around the circle there, the various um, sub-disciplines of learning analytics. Uh, in our project, we focused on early interventions. We looked at some predictive modeling. Um, we even touched on sentiment analysis. Uh, and um, certainly, we were trying to optimize learning success as well. Uh, on the next slide, we talk a little bit more about predictive analytics itself. Um, we try to understand the student learning based on what happened in the past uh, what is, and what is happening now so that we could better predict what will happen in the future to help our students thrive. From here, I'm going to turn it back over to Maureen to talk about how we did this. And again, uh, one of our bedrock foundational principles of the Murrow First Year Experience is that all students should master this course. All students should be successful not only in these two one credit courses, but throughout their Notre Dame career. In order to make that happen, we wanted very, very, very deliberately to keep an eye on early um, pieces of evidence of student learning and connection with the course. We have two types of identification processes. One very early in the semester, be, um, looking at student work between weeks one and week six. How are they actually orienting to Notre Dame? How are they working in this environment? So we look at, for an early identification, weeks one through six, students who are missing more than two homework assignments. We've seen over the years that that is the best indication that students aren't connected to the course. They're not likely to succeed. Following that around midterm, we look at our Sakai gradebook and we're looking for more concrete grading information on how students are doing in, in different um, assignments throughout the course. So with these two tools, 
we feel confident that we're seeing not only the whole class, which in general, historically at Notre Dame does quite well, but we're finding any students who show very early signs of distress or students at midterm who could use an additional boost. And Alex will talk more about this in, in detail. But at these two points, because we have this data, we can connect with the students and again, help them find a way for themselves how to, survive, um, how to thrive in this environment. So our notifications come in two forms. In the early notification, weeks one through six, we talk to, as course administrators, the students directly. We send them a communication so that they can, sort of from the bottom up, realize that they may not be doing well in this course and for themselves construct a plan to remediate their work and connect and do better. At the midterm, it is much more of a formal process. The course administrators communicate with the first year academic advisors of the students who bring the students in for an appointment and look very deliberately and in detail at course work uh, for the individual student compared to the grading of the whole class. So again, two points of, of um, scrutiny and attention early and midterm so that all students may succeed. And um, in terms of uh, actualizing this information. Again, we're boosting these students' performance so that they, like their colleagues um, in the, the larger student cohort, will succeed in the course. You can see on the left uh, what we send out at the early intervention point, this personalized learner action plan. This goes to the students identified in the first six weeks of the semester who may have missed homework assignments. We ask them to identify the reasons for which they're missing this work and what they will do to, again, improve their performances. We also connect this with campus resources so that any, any um, issue that they may have, we bring to bear on that the campus resources that can support them. At the midterm, again, it's a more formal process. We loop in the academic advisors so that the advisors can talk to the students about their grading data compared to um, not only the students' other courses, but more importantly, to the average scores of courses uh, of students within the Moreau First Year Experience course. To go into this in greater detail, it is my pleasure uh, to pass to Alex Ambrose, who will talk about um, his research on helping students to thrive in this learning environment. Thank you, Maureen. Again, in this step number six, we're asking, how did we do? Were our, pr our predictions accurate? And did these analytics-based boosts have any impact on those final grades? So this, let's take a look and let me walk you through some of our exciting numbers. At midterm, and this is including both our early and mid-semester boost, our postdoc data scientist sees that the majority of the students are thriving. This accounts for 96% of that total first-year student population. That is 1,978 students out of the 2,053 total. Remember, we're defining the thrive category as earning B or better in this particular course at midterm based on our historical trends of the previous two years. However, we also identified 75 or 3.6% of that total first year student population that were not thriving. So we then asked ourselves, out of those 75 students, were, were they able to thrive after we identified and boost them? From our boost intervention, we see that 62 of that 75 identified students did thrive after boost and ended up getting a B or better by the end of the semester. And unfortunately, of those 2,053 students, 13 of those students did not thrive after the boost. So overall, we had an average of 83% success rate in identifying and boosting our most at-risk students. To summarize, let me go back and return to our initial research questions, our initial research goal and hypothesis. Our R&D goal was from the beginning to liberate this data by getting it back in the hands of the learners with this learning analytics process to boost students' potential to thrive without risk of harm in that FYE. Our hypothesis was we believe that this FYE course performance would be a predictor to overall first semester of cumulative GPA. And we were able to confirm this because on average, students who did not thrive in Moreau, B minus or less, did have a lower cumulative GPA than average first year students. In fact, it was a 0.7 average cumulative, cumulative GPA difference, which is pretty significant given our own campus GPA distribution. 
Our research question breakthroughs were answering first, what is the best and the earliest predictor of FYE course performance? For us, it was missing two or more of those weekly preparation prompts within the first six weeks. Second, do our early and mid-semester boosts have a thrive impact? And we said yes, 83%. 83% of the time. So here, here you have it. This is our R&D progress we've made so far using Sakai and the Open Learning Record Warehouse with learning analytics to empower first-year students to thrive. We hope some of this may help you help your students. And at this point, I'm going to turn it back to Zhao Jing to wrap up and Maureen this final stage of reporting. Yeah, as we just shared, the, we specifically designed the process uh, in order to be able to collect data and build reports on those data and then share reports to different stakeholders in a very smooth way. And with this information, it brings to mind a whole host of questions that instructors, administrators, and students have uh, about the course, about their performance, about this idea of success. On the part of instructors, one of the first questions that comes to mind, again, these are instructors from all parts of the university, are, am I as an instructor grading consistently compared to other sections? And students are very, very sensitive to the question, is my instructor fair? Is my roommate's instructor more lenient? And Xiaoxing, what have we found in terms of instructor um, consistency? Sure. Uh, as shown in this top bar chart, and uh, uh, this shows each assignment's average score of all the Moreau students' population. And the top red bar marks the maximum score for that each for that specific assignment. As you can see, our students did very well in this course. And uh, the chart below shows the distribution of all the section's average score for each assignment. Each dot here represents uh, section's average score for a specific assignment. As you can see, except for a few outliers here and here, most of the dots fall into a very narrow range, meaning the grading was consistent. Back to you, Marie. And then, um, because all of this hinges on the data that we pull from Sakai, and, and notably, um, from my point of view, the Sakai Gradebook, as an administrator of the course, I have to ask which students and sections are missing assignments, otherwise my data is incomplete, or students need a boost. Mm -hmm. Xiaoxing, how do we tackle that question? Yes, and this chart shows how many missed submissions each section had on each of the assignment. In the total, we had only 119 missed submissions out of the uh, over 28,000 possible submissions for this semester. This is more evidence for this course design was very effective. Yeah, and that students are engaged, instructors are grading. It's a phenomenal um, success that only 119 submissions are missing out of such a large number of, of total submissions. Sure. Um, that said, again, on the sort of the, the note of engagement and connectedness to the materials, uh, program directors are really interested, you know, are the students accessing the materials? Uh, which ones are most engaging? Which ones will we keep as we uh, adapt and improve the course year to year? And what's the optimal timing for selecting course content given the academic calendar at Notre Dame? Sure. Uh, the, the chart on the left shows the total number of unique clicks on each of the course resources. Uh, the green color represents resources that were clicked by over 90% of the students. And the red color represents resources that were clicked by less than 75% of the students. And the orange color represents number in between. And we can also, we can see a ma the majority of the resources were clicked by over 90% of the students. We can also drill down to find out the most clicked resources and the least clicked resources. For example, this chart shows the top five most clicked resources. As you can see, two of them are instructions on assignments. It's good that our students read, do read as, uh, assignments instructions. And uh, the chart below here shows uh, a bottom five list click resources. One feature all of them share 
is they were scheduled towards the end of the course. For example, three of those resources were scheduled at the last week of the course. So this is telling us not to schedule the important topics at the end of the course. And our students and their instructors fatigued by the end of a long and, and difficult semester. Uh, we're also curious about um, this idea of the effectiveness of the flipped class model. You know, how do we know as instructors if our students are accessing course content before class as instructed, and thus are they really prepared for class? And does the online preparedness match in-class preparation in any particular way? Yes. And uh, this tree map shows the total number of clicks each student had on all the resources. Each block represents a student. For example, this circled student 10 had a total number of 11 clicks on all the resources. We can also drill down to find out which resources the student clicked for how many times and which resources the student didn't click. For example, uh, this high, uh, this so-called student 10 didn't click any resources in week 9, week 10, and week 11. So uh, an instructor really could know, again, that the student's not connecting with course material, and that's a course, um, an opportunity for conversation. Sure, yeah. Um, much of the course material is reading materials, but much is also uh, video. So we want to know as instructors, you know, do students watch the video and actually how much of the video um, are they watching? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, as shown in this um, packed bubble chart, we can find out how many minutes the students spend on watching those five videos. For example, this circled student one spent over 20 minutes on watching those five videos. Again, we can drill down to find out which video the student watched for how long and which video the student didn't watch. For example, this student, this student one didn't watch either of this video and this video. And also to extrapolate a little bit, this helps us convey to our content um, providers that videos should be shorter rather mm -hmm. than longer. And it also helps us improve course content to semester to semester to see what the average student mm -hmm. is watching and at what um, level of intensity or frequency. Indeed. Yeah. Um, with all of this information and with students in mind, instructors in mind, and, and larger campus imperatives in mind, uh, perhaps the, the largest question um, to ask at the end of things is, is the course improving year to year? And thanks to all of this data, plus surveys administered both internally and um, through the provost office, our course instructor feedback survey, uh, we would like to know in detail how the course looks over its history from fall 15 through spring 18. Um, these charts um, show the different composite scores from our course information feedback form. And we can see clearly that in all measures, clarity and organization, overall instructor composite scores, stimulation of learning, and guidance and support, we can see an upward trend of student satisfaction with the course. We're extremely pleased about this. This is a large required class. Um, this is great news um, on campus that the course is uh, well received by students as these trends tick upward. We have an 80% retention rate of instructors coming back uh, for a second and third year of teaching. So the indications are good, thanks to the very assiduous data collection of our collaborative teams, that the course is indeed uh, improving on campus for the benefit of our first year students. And I will pass back to Kevin to summarize, again, the lessons from the design and what might apply at your campuses. So uh, when we're looking at what we learned from this for the last three years, we have learned that it's uh, it is very scalable. We can take this other large courses. And in fact, we're doing that this semester. We're working with engineering as well as our uh, Department of uh, Science, our, our College of Science as well, and other courses to, uh, to be able to use this and, and uh, hopefully enrich our data as well. So we have more data to be able to uh, help us to guide students, help them thrive better in, in a first year experience. Um, we also found that uh, the Sakai, the Open Learning Record, Warehouse and Tableau Connection has really helped us uh, to be able to produce some great reports. And, uh, and as you can see, some of the reports we've had, it's very useful data. And um, that connection has helped us also to be able to learn a lot of things that we didn't think we could 
we never at the very beginning thought we would learn or understand. So it's been very useful for that. And uh, we've also learned that design for the course has been very uh, crucial for us and helping us to, to remove the student barriers so that we can um, to learning, but also help to collect good data and to enable the analysis that we've been able to do. Um, we've also uh, found that we can help our students thrive uh, by using learning analytics. And we've sort of proven that this past few semesters and you saw the information that Alex talked about. So I think that is a very uh, important lesson we learned. And uh, patience, uh, you know, we've been doing this for three years now, going to our fourth year, and it's taken a lot of work and expertise to get this growing, uh, but also it's taken a lot of time. So that's something that we need to make sure that uh, people understand this is not something that just happened just this past semester. It takes a lot of time to do these things. And some of our next steps, um, I can mention we we're planning on working with other large first year courses. We're doing that right now, getting them ready for fall. Um, we plan to put use dashboards um, and uh, we're looking at the Marist Open Analytics as well in their predictive modeling. And we like to text mine a lot of our written reflections, which is a ton of data out there. And I forget how much data we had, it's a large number. And uh, we also would like to uh, complete our implementation of the OAP the uh, LRW, which we have now, finally. So we're uh, on track for that. And here's some of our, uh, sort of our related references, if you'd like to see some of the uh, articles that have come out of this or because of this. And uh, here's, again, a link to the project and our contact information. And now we'd like to open uh, this up to questions, and I see that there are already some in the chat. Uh, yes, that's a very good question. Yeah, the click, uh, clicks on the resources can mean uh, a lot of things. And uh, thanks to Kevin and Alex, and they connected us with a research group in our computer science department, and they are helping us to analyze the sequence, how, uh, the sequence of the clicks. We hope, hopefully, we can find out more information to find out if the clicks is a result of confusion or if the click, clicks is a simply a result of interest in the resource. Thank you for that question. It's a very good question. I'm not sure if I answered your question. Anybody, please fill in. No, I think please you answered it perfectly. Yeah. I'd just like to add to the other area we're looking at this click sequence is um, do they did or they did not click on a a content resource before they answer the homework assignment. So maybe uh, maybe they didn't actually do the reading and they kind of phoned in a, a light reflection. We're looking at that as well. So that's a great question to point us to a deeper um, flashlight into the click, click streams. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we have to realize that just because someone also clicked on a resource doesn't mean they actually read the resource. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of the videos, we do have a pretty good understanding of how long the student watched the videos because we can get that data out but unfortunately once you click a pdf you know you don't really have any, any indication uh, if the student actually read it or not so you have to take it in you know in conjunction with other data any other questions Anyone else have any questions for our speakers? Okay, great. Well, it's well, not. Um, it's our contact information. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And thank you very much for um, for reviving that presentation for us from from Open Imperio. It was very informative. Um, I'm sure it's going to give folks lots of ideas on on things that they can do. Um, at their own institutions along these lines. So thank you very much, um, all of you, for sharing your, your experience with us. So we have a few minutes left. Um, typically, we, um, we take a couple minutes to talk about future meetings, themes, or topics. 
So um, I don't know if anybody has any suggestions for um, things that they would like to see for future uh, teaching and learning calls. I don't know. Um, let me look and see. Do we have the next few booked out, Matt? Do you recall? I knew we had a few people lined up, but I can't remember when they were speaking. I think we do have an opening on August 1st. I know that's a difficult time for many people because we're starting to get into the back to school time, but we do have an opening right now on August 1st. On August 15th, uh, we have another Atlas award-winning presentation. So Michael Friesen from the University of Western Ontario is going to recap his presentation on online learning socially and safely. And then I think at some point um, we are going to have another presentation uh, from Notre Dame uh, with Laura Geckler and Allison Lansky talking about some of the things that they've done to bring the NGDLE, the infamous NGDLE, to Sakai now at Notre Dame. Um, that has not been officially scheduled yet, but probably sometime uh, coming up in September or October. Okay. Well, let's see. Does anybody want to volunteer for August 1st? <laughs> Hearing background music. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, if anybody does think of something that they would like to present on August 1st, please let either me, Matt, or Tricia know, and we'd be happy to add you to the schedule. Um, if not, I'm sure that uh, that's probably a good opportunity for a Jira Palooza that we haven't done in a little while. Um, there's always lots of teaching and learning Jiras that we can uh, get feedback from the group on. So, um, so, uh, Provided that we don't have a, a presenter, we'll plan on Jirapalooza for August 1st. But hopefully you will join us um, for the uh, the 15th, which is that um, Michael Friesen uh, Atlas presentation. And, um, and then the Notre Dame session, which will come after once we settle on a date. Uh, so let's see if there's anything else. Um, any other topics people would like to request, perhaps, that we could reach out to presenters about? Nope. Oh, maybe that was a vote for karaoke. Oh, was that the music? <laughs> I was just seeing that in the chat. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Well, I guess we will wrap up a couple minutes early then. So thank you everyone for joining us. And thanks again to our presenters for sharing their um, wonderful presentation with us. And I hope you all have a great day. You do. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank thanks, presenters. This was awesome. <laughs>